help women save lives and peacefully end abortion where you live. I can tell you exactly uh, what would happen. Um, The infant would be delivered. Uh, The infant would be kept comfortable. Uh, The infant would be resuscitated if if that's what the uh, mother and the family desired. You were serious about that? Be inspired to change hearts and minds by joining over one million volunteers taking part in the global movement happening in your neighborhood. She says, pray that I can get through this abortion. And I said, oh, no, no. So she went ahead and went into the abortion clinic. And she just came out. She told me, I'm not going to get the abortion. We just had a baby shaved. But we had a baby shaved and never to go. Pray the Lord. This is the 40 Days for Life podcast with your host, Sean Carney. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the 40 Days for Life podcast. I am Sean Carney, the president of 40 Days for Life and your host for this podcast, which is dedicated to helping you end abortion where you live. This is part two of our questions podcast. We're going to try to get to all the questions. Um, But if we don't, we will do a third episode. So email us at podcast at 40daysforlife.com. If uh, we don't answer your question, if you have a question, or if the answers to these questions provokes another question, you can email uh, that in. So this is part two. If you did not catch uh, part one, go back and watch that and um, or listen to it, and then you'll be caught up, and we are in part two, and that just means we're wearing the same clothes as we were wearing in the previous episode. So there you go. We're not trying to hide that. Somebody who always has clothes on, thankfully, is <laughs> Mr. Steve Carlin, who joins us from Madison, Wisconsin. So <laughs> before you answer that, <laughs> I created a little awkward moment for you. I didn't realize, like, I've introduced you in a weird way. I felt like I've done that a few times, but Jill, our editor, is like, you've done it, like, every time. <laughs> so we had... We have a supporter who is extremely interested in a podcast episode that just shows my introductions, introducing (laughs) you and you responding. All right. I want to know, do the listeners have, that's a lot of work for Jill, but Jill would be so excited about doing it. I think she would just do it. Um. I want to know if the listeners want that or if that's the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> Just be back-to-back clips of your introductions of me? And your responses. Okay. And, and if there's like a minute or so in there, you know, she can include that. I am joined, of course, back in Texas, Mr. Steve Carlin, who is still wearing a sweater in case a snowstorm comes. I am never, as cold as it is in Wisconsin, I am never colder than indoors in Texas. There's a lot of good, there's a lot of bad, and there is some ugly. So joining me on this patriotic uh, 40 Days for Life podcast episode, somebody who is not ugly at all, but does love his country greatly, and that is Mr. Steve Carlin in Madison, Wisconsin. Steve, happy 4th. Hey, happy 4th of July. At least one of those two things that you just said is true. I do love my country. And to join me on this conversion podcast is somebody who has converted many people um, on many different issues, and that is Mr. Steve Carlin. Welcome. Good to be here. I've tried to convert you on football teams, but it seems like I'm making zero progress on that. Zero progress. I'm very stubborn, closed-minded, and intolerant when it comes to that. Yeah, very much. Big. I'm a Packer bigot. I don't like the Packers because of who they are. But obviously, let's say it's a 60-minute episode. The intros are max 30 seconds, me introducing you, and then you responding. So that's 120 the anti-banter contingent of the podcast listeners, I think, would probably pass on that one. But this is why we actually have, like, the first, we'll usually put, like, the banter ends at 1431 or whatever. So they'd have to they'd have to sit that whole episode out. But I agree. I think that it would help us measure how many pro-banter people we have. Oh, yeah. I think it still is the majority. If it's banter only. Um since we started noting that most people are pro banter, I get a lot more feedback of like, I know I'm the minority here, but you guys could get to the point once yeah, in a yeah, while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, and we appreciate those people. They've conceded. But like, they are throwing them a bone by letting them know. A lot of our stuff is heavy and very serious. The topic is heavy and very serious, obviously. And the podcast is a way we can kind of lighten the mood, and that's via the banter. And most people like the banter. And guess what? 
technology allows us to skip. This I, is not a live program, y'all. Right. <laughs> but you would be skipping on some unbelievable educational opportunities. Some of these people wouldn't know what surge is. Uh, they would have no idea that, uh, like, Shasta. We talked about Shasta. Yeah. You know, Steve learned what Shasta was. Your Oppenheimer turkey. The Oppenheimer turkey. That's not banter. That's an actual episode. That's accurate, yeah. That's a substance. Tecmo Bowl in high schools. <laughs> Uh, I, the last episode we made the point, it didn't occur to me till we were actually recording, is that m most of our listeners, most of the 40 Days for Life audience are 45 to 80, right? So we have a lot of boomers. So they're like in our parents' generation. So they get the 90s references because of their kids. And then, of course, people our age definitely get the references because they, they grew up during that era. So... I'm just justifying referencing the 90s. Sure. It's a good justification. When movies were way better. Mm -hmm. and we all know it. Okay. With that said, hold on. I have one more question for you. Before you worked here, you listened to the podcast where you, you had to be anti-banter. Oh, I skipped the first five minutes. That was back when it was five minute long banter. <laughs> we tripled it. There's a lot of layers of that response right there. Oh, that's just like, and I'm against it now. And I have to participate in it. <laughs> However, that was in the earlier days when y'all were 100% sports banter every time. Now it's like 80%. That's true. It really was a lot of like Cowboys and Packers. Stuff. We've had eras. We've had football eras. We've had weather eras. We've had, you remember the, uh, this is a real blast from the past, Robert's Cucumber Sandwich era was yes. a whole like two months <laughs> worth of banter. Yes. Yes. But I'm also impatient, so that's why I was always like, all right, here's the topic. I'm going to get to the topic. <laughs> C. Tillman, this is a question. Here we go. This is, this is, we're starting this podcast off. Ha! Slap your mama. Slap your mama. <laughs> Thanks for the email prayer request for the symposium. I immediately stopped and prayed for your upcoming symposium for each of the intentions in your email. Thank you. And for all of you and your families, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for what you are doing. Here's my question. <clears throat> Statements from Donald Trump and uh, Vice, uh, his VP choice, J.D. Vance, and from many other leaders in the Republican Party are attempting to soften their pro-life message. It seems to be an attempt to appeal to more voters, which I believe is a big mistake. However, I am disappointed to hear several pro-life leaders and uh, traditional Catholic voices say that they will not vote for Trump, which I believe is a major mistake. It is clear to me that the survival of our nation, including religious freedom and the pro-life movement at large, depends on the outcome of this election. Would you please share your personal thoughts on this matter and offer some guidance for traditional practicing Catholics? God bless Charles Tillman. Great, <laughs> great name, by the way. Um, I think he asked a question and answered it in, in a lot of ways. Obviously, we don't endorse candidates. Mm -hmm. But um, so here has been my Republicans are going soft on abortion 101. Number one. Donald Trump was being highly encouraged by some in the pro-life movement to do a 15-week ban, which would have been a disaster for these pro-life states and a huge compromise post-Roe. He did not do that. He saw that that was not good and that was a compromise post-Roe, and he didn't do it, okay? So Vance and he are four exceptions politically. We don't know what any of these people believe, like, deep down. But uh, I believe Trump is really pro-life, and if he's not, He's horrible at hiding it because he was by far the most pro-life president in history. Um, it would be odd for a pro-life person not to vote for the most pro-life president ever. I don't think that's a hot take. I just think that it's, it's just weird. Um, it's not drafting Tom Brady because you don't like his haircut. So the other thing is that they are... I can't get to the bottom of the abortion pills thing. Vance said he was against it, then for it, then against it, then it was out of context. So I, I can't figure that one out. Maybe y'all can fill it in. So I can't speak to that. Um, but the abortion, this it's about abortion. Kamala's going to run on abortion as a number one issue, which no one's ever done, and I think is extremely risky. We don't like people who run on the culture war as their number one issue. 
Americans don't go for that, so they don't do it. Um, so that's risky. But it is a very, it's a big free speech election. But when he's saying, hey, my like hardcore Catholic friends, they say they're not going to vote for Trump. I don't, I don't know if I believe them. I believe we have a moral obligation to vote, period. So you have two candidates. Maybe they're not going to vote for Trump because he's for exceptions. I, I don't know. I really thought the Republicans were going to cave at the convention and we were going to be screwed. And that didn't happen. It really did. And I know that sounds like a lame thing. Like, it's not as bad as I thought it was. But I really thought they were going to cave on abortion. Kudos to some of the groups that we work with in this movement who are more involved in the political process. Totally. Who kind of sounded the alarm to help make sure that did not happen. Yeah. No. Total kudos. Um, but it's easy in July to get mad at Donald Trump or J.D. Vance or any politician. But to say they're, like, not going to vote, isn't this, like, the people that said they weren't going to vote for Hillary, but but ended up voting anyways. Certainly the people that said they weren't going to vote for Trump the first time. Like, it's at the very least the RFK people. Oh, man, RFK is pulling at 14%. Uh, that could swing the election. Like, you always see the third party guys looking really great in May and June. And then when it hits October, like, am I really going to throw away my vote? And they don't. They go with one of the two candidates. I think that's the phenomenon that probably fits what you're describing. I don't think Trump has done anything... I would say f from a pro-life perspective, I mean, he came out and he said, I'm against late-term abortions. All other abortions are fine. That would kill the pro-life vote. Uh, but he hasn't done that. Um, and I also think, <laughs> I've heard some say he's not going to do anything at the federal level, which is so naive and so dumb. Everything is on the table for Donald Trump. You don't know what he's going to do tonight. But if he gets the Senate and the House or the House, it only like he's going to do stuff for the unborn. There's no doubt. And the left knows it. We still have sort of this discourse, I think, that assumes that it's 1984 and that Congress is still making laws and doing right. what Congress is authorized to do by the Constitution. And the fact of the matter is probably yeah, I, I doubt that President Trump, if he's reelected, would sign any legislation into law because you need 60 votes. So all these discussions on what pro-abortion or pro-life bill are you going to sign, they're almost all moot because there will be no legislation passed. You need 60 senators again. But what do you have the authority to do? What did President Obama say? He said, I've got a phone and I've got a pen. And he used it. Yeah, and he did. And the Biden administration is using it. And in many ways in favor for the pro-life cause, the Trump administration had used it already. And so if we think about things like are we going to get the 15-week ban or the six-week ban or what level of protections will we have passed by Congress? None. None. But there's a lot of stuff. You care about conscience rights for your doctor? That is stuff that, that uh, you know you're not going to get from one candidate, but you probably will from another. Uh, they were very strong on that topic in the, in the first term of, of the Trump administration. There's a lot of these little things where we don't know. We, everyone talks about the deep state running our lives. If you're concerned about the deep state, they've got a big hand in, in the abortion debate, and you don't need Congress to do that. But Trump has said a lot of dumb stuff. And then on, on the life issue, I know he says a lot of stuff, but... Um, bigly. Bigly. And he fixes it. Or he doesn't fix it. He, he corrects it. I mean, he was like, I think that's terrible what DeSantis did in Florida. That six weeks, that was terrible. The heartbeat bill's terrible. And he got hammered for it, and then he, he bailed on all that. Um, he does, uh, on our issue, on the... On the free speech, religious freedom, and pro-life fronts, Trump listens to those around him. That's how we ended up with the three Supreme Court justices. It's kind of amazing because I know he doesn't listen to people on a lot of stuff, but he does on this. I think because he's not very familiar with it and he doesn't really know what's going on, you know, but he knows he's pro-life. So um, anyways, um, I do think he said horrible things that make people be like, what's he doing? Um, but over time, he bails on him or he corrects himself. Um, and he did that with the 15 week ban. He did that with the heartbeat bill. Um, you know, he could definitely botch abortion uh, going into the election. But uh, all these people that say, if you like, I'm, I'm not going to vote for Trump for ABC, and it has to do with abortion. I think it's fair. The problem with Trump is Trump. So if you remove the Trump part. And what's great about Trump. And, we, and what's great about <laughs> it. We all know, and we all know what we're talking about right now. But. <laughs> If you remove that and you just compare him to Romney, 
was it pro-lifers excited about? They all voted for Romney, but it's just like. Who was airing campaign ads in the closing days of the campaign saying, what do you mean I'm against aborting babies conceived in rape? Of course I'm in favor of that. Yeah. Mm. He just, he, bad candidate, bad everything. Everybody went and voted for him, of the pro-lifers. Uh, McCain. I mean, I'm a great example of this, w. like reactionaryism. I went into the 08, 2012, and 2016 elections. There was a stretch where I was like, I'm voting third party. I'm, I'm going to look down upon everybody else. Cause yeah. I'm, I, I had that. And in the end, I I voted for who I voted for in every one of those elections, even though I didn't think I was going to because I was disgusted by something or another. Well, in, in a row era, it was I'm pro-life and I'm pro-abortion. But it's the same way in post-row. You know, but I mean, W, who ended up being a fairly weak pro-life uh, president, um, you know, he gave us a Lido. That was great. But I don't know. It's just when you look at some of these candidates, I don't even know if it came up in the Dole Clinton election. Not much. I don't know. You know Different times. Definitely came up more in 92 with Clinton. Um, but I don't know. I just I, I do think people are like. Like it's some courageous act to say I'm not going to vote for Donald Trump when half the it's kind of venting, is. right? Yeah, you're frustrated, so you got to find a way to stick it to somebody. We get more, I think, criticism at 40 Days for Life when we talk about Trump than for any other reason. And for me, it's kind of interesting because I see it. You got, and we've criticized them. Well, half of the people come in saying like, "Hey, why are you supporting this? You know, philandering yeah. life president?" And then half of the people are like, "How can you not be supporting him more? You're traitors to this movement." Yes. And to me, it's sort of the chest Chesterton thing, where if you're criticized for being too tall and too short, you're probably a, a good height. And I think that's where it is here. Like, we're going to talk about the things that he does that are good, and we're going to talk about the things that he does that are bad. And the listeners and the viewers can draw their own conclusions from it. But it's important to be honest what, on either side. I, I think it's I think it's been a strong approach that we've taken by, by not shying away from the difficulties, but taking them head on. But I will address something besides abortion, and that is... Uh, we know as a fact that the Kamala Biden regime has weaponized the DOJ. Yeah. So that is a free speech. Trump did not. Um, in fact, our friends at the FBI were like, when he was elected, it was awesome. Because it was just like he cut the, the, the rubber band holding everything together and was like, go arrest all these bad guys. Like the actual bad guys. Like the... The red tape and all that of you can't do this, you can't do that. They're can't. not they're not agreeing to plea deals with yeah. the guy who planned September 11th. Exactly that kind of stuff that the FBI yep. loved when Trump came in, and so the free speech thing is an issue. That that is definitely uh, an issue because the weaponization of the DOJ sounds like something your like uncle would rant about, but we've experienced it <laughs> in 40 Days for Life, and it's actually real. You can ask Mark Hauk, and that's a problem. That's a problem. There's the cliche that personnel is policy. And I think that's a big thing. Like we all know people and in fact have friends who worked during the first Trump administration. And I remember there was a, a friend of mine who was in the administration, like gave me a heads up, like keep an eye on the news tomorrow. There's going to be some interesting religious liberty news. I thought, oh, cool. And then it came out and I was at his house and I said, did you, did you do this? Is this you? He's like, I just serve the American people in the administration. I was like, that's great. You're a humble guy. I appreciate that. Did you do this? <laughs> yeah. And he said, let's just say when I took the job, I had certain objectives in mind. <laughs> nice. Okay. This is Brandy. Could you please touch base on how to approach sharing our faith when we may only have a little time to reach a woman? Maybe some good ways to plant a seed that you've seen has worked with some women and hasn't turned them away from the gospel. Okay, here's what I always say for this situation, because, <clears throat> again, here's another way we get criticized for not being enough and also being too much, and that is religious, mm -hmm. being not religious enough on the sidewalk and also being too religious. Um, take the approach uh, by looking at Christ's example in the gospel, uh, he, he met people where they are. That's what we are called to do on the sidewalk. My, the first things out of my mouth, nor would I ever say this, but the first things out of my mouth when I go to the sidewalk are not going to be, hey, do you know that if you have an abortion, you're going to hell, you know, or something stupid like that. 
Like Steve uses that all the time. <laughs> you can do this. You will you do can. this. <laughs> you have to watch part one. Yeah, to get that reference. But um, I, I, I've we've definitely been. Or accused. Jesus loves you. Yeah. Well, and does that count? Is that bad that I said don't say Jesus loves you? That's that certainly could be something you could say. But that if I'm really trying to meet her where she is, first of all, I'm using context clues. Um, does she have like you know mm -hmm. what what kind of bumper stickers does she have in her car? Is she dressed in goth? I don't know very many devout Christians who are dressed in goth. It's there not, are some. It's not goth anymore. It's, it's um, emo. Emo, yeah. Whatever. It's probably actually changed since that. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Hannah can tell. Not like a little bird, the emu. <laughs> no, not emu. Okay, tangent. But oh. um, if someone if someone is very much uh, giving off the vibe, the vibes that they are are. Deter they are uh, going to be deterred by a scripture or some sort of religious, what seems to them like a radical zealot uh, talking point or anything like that. That's not going to be my first go-to because I'm trying to do just what Christ did. He met people with their physical needs. He, um, it's one of my favorite things that I have to, that I laugh at every time I hear this gospel, but he supped with them. I always think that sounds hilarious. <laughs> it says he supped with him, with them. Um, he met the Samaritan woman at the well. He met the tax collector Zacchaeus. Um, you know, he, he goes to where people are and he um, connects with them. And that's what we should be doing as people going to the sidewalk. So even if you are not saying verbally words from the Bible, it does not mean, it definitely does not mean you are not being Christ to someone. And... Um, People, the old saying goes, people aren't going to care what you know until they know that you care. That very much applies here mm -hmm. because they we're strangers to them. We don't know what they're going through. We know not, according to them and their mindset, a lot of us do, but in their mindset, we have no clue what they're going through. We've never experienced anything like that. We don't have any women on the sidewalk who have had abortions, that sort of thing, or have worked in the abortion industry. And so have that mindset Always be praying. We're not hiding that we're praying. I mean, if our heads bowed and hands folded isn't an obvious enough sign, the signs further down the street that say praying to end abortion or something that, like that. Isn't that, though, and specifically to her question, isn't that a good ending to your little 30-second interaction is that we're here to help you and we're praying yes. for you? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great thing. And in the end, I have found 95% of the time they don't take it as like the condescending, like, we're praying for you. Yeah, you're going to kill your baby and you're going to burn in hell. So we're definitely praying for you. And also yeah. it's about the tone. I mean, yeah. if, if you're going to say it in a tone that sounds very condescending, she's probably going to take it that way. They usually appreciate it or say thank you, particularly to women who say it. Yeah. O older women. <clears throat> yeah. It could like be their mom or grandma. And we hear many times of situations where someone was touched by the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. You know, they saw that on the sidewalk and they were touched by that. So it's not that we water anything down. It's not that we hide from our faith. None of that. We are actually, that's how we can plant that seed is we can be that, we can be Christ to that person and show them that we love them. If I get an opportunity to pray, which I have before with someone, and I'll ask them, um, you know, thank you for sharing what you're going through. I know this is really tough. I want to try to uh, get you to a place that can help you ongoing and can assess your needs. Would it be okay if I prayed with you? And 99 times out of 100, they're going to say yes. And I just pray with them. I pray over them. Um, and usually tears start coming. By the way, this hasn't come up, but it needs to be said because we're all having fun and all that. But the listeners need to know that Heather is one of the best sidewalk counselors in the world. I Literally, you are. Well, you that. don't. You can't say that. Well, I'm number one in the yeah. world. It's not even close. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> number two is a disaster. People are having abortions all over the place with number two. Yeah, no, it, you are. You are. We really we need to state that um, because I don't think we've we've. But in Austin, multiple lo different locations, you've sidewalk counseled constantly for twenty years. Not quite that long, but close. Okay, so. We want to say that because you're getting awesome. This is why I, I read this question and then did this. <laughs> um, I do think the the we're praying for you goes a really long ways. Mm -hmm. um, 
it it can ring in their ear when they're sitting right. in the, uh, the waiting room contemplating the abortion. We've heard many stories of where a woman came out and said, I was thinking about it, or I really appreciate you praying for me. And they're expecting you to be overly religious in a negative sense of that term and annoying and judgmental. So even the the assessment that you do, which is great, they have a rosary hanging down, they yeah. have a whatever, a scripture verse, bump, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. bumper sticker. They think that abor- them having an abortion is okay because they're at the abortion facility. So when you, it's for our own knowledge to kind of know there's you know some seeds there, but it doesn't mean it's like you're wearing a cross. Do you know the Bible says thou shalt not kill? You know, uh, it's not for that purpose um, because obviously that that can backfire. But I tell you, the thing is, is that it's not us bringing it up; it's them. Often it is. Yeah. They bring up God. That's true. Because they feel guilty. Yeah. And we do that. We all do this with our own sins. You know, we're just like, well, you know, I'm a good person. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, that is. That's, if you got to say it out loud, it's yeah, true. That's true. So it's just one of those things. Um, when we justify any behavior, we were like talking ourselves out of it and we're referencing all of a sudden we're like quoting scripture. Well, one one thing that I've gotten before and um, I find that really works is when I'm trying to I'm talking to her. She's actually, you know, talking. We're listening. We're talking back and forth and I'm trying to f- gauge like how is she going to respond if I offer to pray or if we talk, if I bring religion into this. So usually what I'll do is I'll just say do you mind if I ask, do you believe in God? I mean, if it, again, if it's not obvious, like you said, with a cross or a rosary or something like that. Is this, how far in the conversation are you? This could be anywhere from a minute to 10, okay. 15 Cause minutes. Okay, because this is what Brandy's asking, so it, here we are. are it, you, yeah, Brandy's asking about the, the quick how moment. How quick? So, uh, again. Do you believe in God? You asked that. If she's coming over to talk to you and she's like, you know, you can try to talk me out of this, but this is the right thing for me, da 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 And she's actually standing there and willing to have a conversation with you, then I, that's, I wouldn't be, as she's walking by me, trying to ignore me, going, hey, hey, c- c- tell me, do you believe in God? Like, that's that's not going to really be as effective as I'd like that to be because she's already trying to walk You in. don't know the day nor the hour. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> Like it's didn't turn around. <laughs> I think there's something in this conversation. I don't I'm not saying Brandy's doing it, but I've seen this discussion had many times where there's an artificial division placed between yes. the gospel and meeting someone's immediate physical yes. material needs. Saying hello. Yeah. Jesus was strategic and savvy in his communication, right? Yes. He was he, he healed the guy and and he's like, Yeah, I healed the guy. Because what's easier, doing that or just starting off with your sins are forgiven, but that you may know that I have the authority. Mm -hmm. And so I I really think that... He also runs off every time afterwards. Yes. And goodness, how often have we heard from a woman who has chosen life, they've they've never had someone in their life who cares about them, and now a complete stranger does, and why is it? Like, the gospel makes itself known pretty clearly through the support that is being offered practically out on the sidewalk. And the question we always get is, what do we say at first? You know, and you're like, good morning. Yeah, greeting. How's it going? Good morning. You know, I mean, that just goes so far. And all of a sudden the wall, because Planned Parenthood's like, they're terrorists. They're going to kill you. They're going to bomb the clinic. Don't talk to them. All that goes away when they say, good morning. You know, or I know this is a hard day for you today. Instantly. Yes. You know, yeah. that's, the, that's the, the number one go-to. Yeah. I know this is a hard day for you. Two, two more things. Um, it, again, usually you can't say it in the first 30 seconds, but if you're able to, if she's actually listening to you or willing to talk with you, um, I would I would ask, you know, do you believe in, do you mind if I ask, do you believe in God? And the next question I ask after that, because I've only once, I think maybe twice gotten the answer, no. Almost everyone says they believe in God. And then I will say, what do you think God thinks about abortion? And only one time... When someone responded, did they say, God's totally fine with abortion? Every other time, people are like, he doesn't, God's not okay with it. Wow. But, send a presumption, I know he's going to forgive me. That's usually what follows with that. Like, this is justified for me. I wouldn't encourage this, but... This is a this is an exception, and I have to have this, and God's going to forgive me. So that's good that you said that's the sin of presumption. Well, we presume that God's going to forgive me, so it doesn't matter. There's another um, 
That's also an attack on truth, mm-hmm. which is not just ignoring, like, I don't have to follow God. I can just observe or admire. Um, but it denies the actual stain of sin. So I'm trying to think of some analogy. I mean, like, you can say, um, like, as if there's just no consequence, which the consequence is you're going to live with with an abortion. You're going to have this anniversary. You're going to wonder, was it a boy or a girl? Mm-hmm. You're going to, oh, well, his birthday probably would have been in March. And, you know, you're going to go through that. Like, sin's not free. Forgiveness is, mm-hmm. but healing's not. Mm-hmm. We know that, mm-hmm. right? And so it's just that attack on basic common sense, which is you can sin and actually get away with it and it have no repercussions to you or do any damage to your future post-forgiveness. And that's just not true. Um, that's why the post-abortive women are the best at this, that they're, they're forgiven, they're not fully healed. That's an, healing is an ongoing process. Um, and that's with, that's with all of us, but as if there's no, no stain you know, um, from, from the sin itself. Right. Ask anybody who's had their like husband or wife cheat on them. Oh yeah. You know, that there's, there's just like, well, I know my husband will forgive me. I know God will forgive me. And it's like, yeah, but dinner's going to be awkward. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I'll say. I think that this also undermines the notion of choice. When you've got women who say that it's wrong, I know it's wrong. God knows it's wrong. I know that God knows it's wrong, and yet I am still compelled to go through with it. There's not a complete sense of exercising a freedom in such a case. This is where it being illegal works. Yes. Because people will say it's it's legal, so it must be okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's true. Yeah. yeah but, but it's like it's 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 the same with like drunk driving. The fact that it's illegal is probably why so many people who otherwise would don't do it, you know, and the people that just don't care because they're drunks and they don't care, they're just going to do it anyways. But, like, there, if there's a legal repercussion, uh-huh. it's yeah. like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. And Abby said that before. Abby Johnson said, I think that had it been illegal when I had my abortions, I wouldn't have done it. 80% of them say that. Because mm. who, who would? I know. Yeah. I mean, we, Which is we, why these ding-dongs that say, well, they're going to do it anyways... It's like the condescending view of women. Like, I don't know. It's a crime. I don't know if they want to do that. Mm -hmm. They also, when something is illegal, they think, well, maybe it should be illegal. Maybe it's not good. Yeah. And if it's legal, maybe it's good. Or it's harder to access, right? Absolutely. You tell me more people aren't smoking marijuana as these dispensaries pop up all over the country. Of course they are. And that's my problem with abortion hasn't ended anywhere guy. Because abortion hasn't ended anywhere guy is like, mm, I think the I think I think the raccoons are having abortions. You know, <laughs> the abortion hasn't ended, and you're just like, practically speaking, it has ended. Okay, but I have yeah, some I have, of these states. I have one more hopefully helpful tip for Brandy and for anyone who might need this. Great question, by the way. When very good question, and one of the things is when you're first like going back to what you said when you're first starting to reach out. That's a big thing. People are like, I don't know what to say. Just greet them like you would anybody else that you're trying to get the, their attention. I wave, I smile. Um, if if their ro- windows up, I try to get them to roll their window down, and I say I might say my name and I say I'm here because there's a lot of great options in the area for pregnancy services and for other services. Which of these would be in, would be more of interest to you? And right there, that eliminates the, you're assuming I'm here for an abortion. You're assu- I'm only here for my birth. I didn't say that. I said pregnancy options and other health care options. Which one of these interests you more? And that is not a yes or no answer. That is a, oh, um, I've, I've rarely gotten a response where they didn't say one or the other. Right. So there you go. I hope that helps. And that might encourage you to um, engage someone a little better. That's a little sales technique right there is you're not giving them an option to turn you down. You're giving them one or the other of which of these options uh, can they can they take or would they um, be served better by. So and they may um, still walk away. They may ignore you. But that's one of those things that you're there because you care about them. You're not there. You're certainly not there for your own self-interest. 
Um, it is not. It is. It is not a super popular thing or a let's get a lot of pats on the back thing to go and pray outside of an abortion facility, especially in this day and age. Yeah. Um, you're there because you care. You know that this is wrong deep down. You know that this hurts the heart of God, and you want to you want to prevent this from happening. I think too. Uh, one thing I experienced a lot of going out, especially early on when we talked about last episode that you know it's super hard to get people out you feel alone you are alone but just loneliness on our side and I think that's very real I would always try to unite that I guess with the loneliness that the women feel going in for abortions because they're often Mm. with one person or just obviously mentally they feel very alone and isolated and they have this problem and they got to get rid of it and then everything's going to get better and of course it doesn't but I think there's loneliness is is a is is something you can experience when participating in 40 days for life mm-hmm. even though there may be other people out there praying um i think that's very real i think it's an attack from the devil um but i definitely experienced it okay we have two political ones that we're going to split with another with some in vitro okay so <laughs> no this is a non controversial <laughs> episode this next one is fun and this is a really great question actually and this is super fun because we get to go into like total full blown like ESPN preseason who's winning the super bowl okay here we go kylie that's her name kylie kylie great Love the spelling. I don't think I've ever seen it spelled like that. Okay. What's the best and worst case scenario for the topic of abortion and the 2024 presidential election in post row political arena? We get to do worst case scenario. I love it. <laughs> right up my alley. Kamala wins. There's a blue wave. Kavanaugh gets pancreatic cancer. Thomas dies. And Amy Coney Barrett resigns. And then... <laughs> <laughs> they 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 don't even bring back Roe. They bring back like like Ugh. crazy, you know. Yeah, like the uh, the thirteenth, the Amendment. Margaret Sanger Memorial Abortion Law, you know. And it's like it it's got a swastika on it, you know. So that's the I think that's a worse scenario. Um, let's um, flesh that out a little bit. That basically means we'd be back to Roe, but probably any and all. It'd be like the no. when we talked about the Freedom of Choice Act. Well, I just back in the- killed off every pro-life Supreme Court justice, so that's probably not realistic. Right. Um, I don't know. Cause, I mean, not everyone, but Justice Thomas is kind of old. No, he, he, he doesn't the, look super healthy. But the next president is going to replace him, probably. Right, yeah. so that's the idea. Which is, they need to bring up. If the next president replaces thomas you don't really know what you're getting out of uh-uh. roberts assume the worst mm-hmm. because we've never been we've never been pleasantly surprised by roberts i hate to say this but because it feels like he was just appointed but we're getting old he's getting old how old is roberts is he, he's over 70 for sure i don't know how old he is Has alito is alito is alito yeah um but all the states like the great state of texas our human life protection act would be overturned but texas was secede We'll secede, but that's that'd be awesome. But that's not in the worst case scenario, though. (laughs) We can't. Here's my theory on secession, since we're going into crazy land. Okay, I'll go. I'll go there. We get tinfoil. Should I get my tinfoil hat out? You're gonna actually need a passport. This isn't this isn't war. This is a peaceful thing. This is this is a everybody wins. Who's the little self help guy that had the win win thing? Okay, this is a win win. Texas says it's not working. You don't like us. We don't like you. We can't drill. We're the 10th largest economy in the world. Um, You think that boys can be girls. Um, Here's the deal. You're going to allow us to have our own currency. We're going to trade with you. We'll deal with Mexico. You just lost that much of the border. You don't have to deal with that. (laughs) Just like the EU, what, like half the military are Texans? We still send our people. We're not getting our own military. You go to the military. And we're our own country. And the Democrats will go for it because we're taking our electoral votes with us. Hmm. It's an interesting, so the liberals would go for it. It's an interesting thought experiment. I don't know if I see it happening. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And the listeners are probably turning this off. But when you talk, everybody's like, 
there would be a war on the Red River. That's not going to happen. There's that, that, that's not never going to happen. They would say, politically, the Democrats would love it. Like, they'd have to have power. They have full power. Republicans would never win another election again in Correct. the U.S. without Texas. And Abbott goes and says, you know, he's an attorney. I know it's in there. We can't secede. Um, we created these documents that would allow it to happen. This is going to be mutual. You get rid of us. You win every election from here on out. We self-govern. We're abortion free. We don't have gay marriage. We're, you know, we're starting over. We have our constitution. We have the greatest flag on earth. Okay, all that's done. You don't even need to start over with the flag. No, we still have the Cowboys and the Texans. You know, it's just like having the Toronto Blue Jays. And uh, we'll sell you oil. You don't have to deal with the Middle East. And you don't have to be, feel guilty about us drilling because we're not part of your country anymore. Well, they'll have to get their oil from the Middle East. Producer John is loving this. I can feel it. Oh, yeah. Okay, he's going to... He's going to be a state senator. The U.S. will have to get its oil from the Middle East because Texas is against LGBT. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> I did not mean to go down this rabbit trail, but but uh, the the is there a grace period like eighteen months? If you want out of Texas, you can go. If you want into Texas, you yeah, can come. Because if this happens, my house is on the market. Uh, uh, our population would triple, and we have the space for it. That's the thing. Houston, Austin, Austin's getting crowded, but there's there's room. Like there's so much land in Texas, and this is why. Uh, look at all the companies that have moved here. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. I mean, big companies that were already companies. here. Yeah. But we 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 would we would have the the oil and gas industry would no longer be connected to Democrats hmm. because Houston's the head of oil and gas around the world. <laughs> it's, You'd have like it's your, a pretty interesting thought experiment. Your sink would be and like it's gonna happen. Hot water, cold water, and crude petroleum. <laughs> <laughs> we start taxing Shiner Bach because we're exporting beer. <laughs> Anyways, okay, okay so, so worst case that was the worst case. <laughs> Back to the question. The worst case scenario is Texas is its own country. That doesn't sound too bad. Oh yeah, everybody would be moving here. Basically, the the worst case is basically when Obama was talking about the Freedom of Choice Act, right? No restrictions yeah. whatsoever. That would be completely legal. Yeah, by means on demand, of the without Court. apology. <laughs> yeah, either they pass it into law or the Supreme Court loses a pro-lifer. Okay, so there's a let's let's get into some details and what people think is a possibility it could happen, and we'll look stupid, which is not against the law. But Trump really caves, like October 2nd. Uh, I'm against all abortions before 15 weeks. I'm not going to do a ban, but like, I've, I've, whatever. And he kills his own voter turnout, but he would just lose. All abortions after 15 weeks. Yeah, I'm against, sorry. I'm against all abortions after 15 weeks. Thank you for that. Um, so, he, and he kills his, his base, like, in October, and that's the October surprise that's self-inflicted, and he loses, and whatever. Um, but I think some people worry about that as a bad scenario, like, nobody's pro-life running. Um, and that's just not the case. The most pro-life president ever is running for re-election. So, um, but I, I think it's obvious for people that this is definitely, uh, as we mentioned, um, a DOJ question. What, what is the power of our government? Mm -hmm. U.S. government's the most powerful thing to ever exist in human history, what we can do. It's unbelievable. Military, our size, our money. Um, so I think people worry about that. I worry about that. Um, so, you know, I think that they're, the, the total best and total worst is somewhat obvious. We either get more pro-life laws or, but what's the best we can hope for on that front? Because the worst case is kind of obvious. It's the absolute worst. Yeah, okay. There's no protections, right. but there's a up, there's a limit to the ceiling. So we'll do, the pro life party we're doing. We're not to, you know we're doing the the platform thing, the the still somehow pro life party. Red wave. Um. I think with the change in politics that is due to Donald Trump they would defund Planned Parenthood. Hmm. And that would be the end of Planned Parenthood, literally. It doesn't matter what California, they, they cannot survive. They don't have the cash flow. Um, what are they, up to 700 billion uh -huh. now? Million. Yeah. Billion. Yeah. Million. 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 It's 700 million. Million. 
Right. Nearly a billion. There's a talking Yes, point. yes. Um, uh, they go under. They got to have that $700 million. Mm -hmm. or, or it's like they're unrecognizable. I mean, they can like cut and gut and do all that stuff. But uh, what that looks like in my view is um, if you want to get greedy, it probably would be a risky thing, but there, there would definitely be a federal push to fund pregnancy centers. I think that they would do that to show that they're compassionate and, and all that good stuff. And then it would sit in a pot <laughs> and pregnancy centers wouldn't take it. Or then a Democrat gets elected and then they, you know, undo it. But I think that would be on the table. I think defunding Planned Parenthood would be on the table. And I do think Trump would do some kind of national ban. And that would be the big debate of what that is. All of this sort of buys us some time, too. We talked about for a while after Roe was overturned. It's not just all sunshine and roses immediately. We need some time for people to get used to the new paradigm, to recognize the women aren't dying in the streets, like what B. Goldberg said. And the more time we have, oh, we've got a, a pro-life president and Roe is gone, and they're not rounding up women and throwing them in prison. I think that sort of thing only works in our favor and allows momentum to build at the state level. And hopefully it's just a, a large-scale pendulum, pendulum shift because you saw the radicalism of the 60s and into the 70s. And what was it followed by? 12 years of Reagan Bush. And right now we've got some insanity on our college campuses and in the streets and in our cities. And I hope that, I hope that it's followed by a similar pendulum swing back towards sanity. Uh, here's another thing. Great question, Kylie. Thank you for allowing us to talk about Texas seceding. Um, <laughs> she's like, that wasn't my question. <laughs> you just started talking about it. Um, if that happens, here's another awesome thing that people need to realize. There's so much bad news, but this is this question brings out good news. Besides the Kavanaugh getting pancreatic cancer and all that stuff, you know, them dying off and being replaced. Um, shut up about abortion, Democrats. If they if there was a red wave, that would be the message. We're sick of it. That's all you preached on. We don't want abortion at 40 weeks. You ran on it, and you refused to look us in the eye as we screamed at you. It's inflation. It's the economy. It's the potential for World War III. It's all this stuff. Yes, we want reproductive rights. Yes, we're mad at the Supreme Court, but our paychecks are more important, and you don't get that, so we're not giving you any power. That's the strong message if there's a red wave is that you're – abortion is the answer to the world's problems bit is up. Mm. I think it's also important that all of this sort of ties into these amendments in Florida and some other states as well. There's, if you could see, um, you know, a pro-life win at the presidential level and the congressional level and pair it with a Florida rejects the constitutional amendment that enshrines abortion, that would be, that'd be a mushroom cloud election. Just like uh, Super Bowl predictions always look stupid later on, so a lot of this will look dumb because we'll see how it plays out. But um, if there's a blue wave, I think this is a worse scenario. If there's a blue wave, the Republicans will blame the pro-lifers. They always do. And they'll change the party platform. Yeah. That's a very – I would say there's a – 15% chance of that happening? I mean, that they get the House and the Senate and the presidency? I don't know. Maybe maybe larger than that. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. But that's pretty realistic. Like, that could happen. There could be a blue wave, and then abortion being pro-life is no longer on the party platform. They just, oh. they, they, because here's what they won't do. They won't blame Trump. And this is the problem. Trump's never done anything wrong. You notice that? It was like he totally botched the first debate in 2020. Mm -hmm. It was there for the taking. He had unbelievable unemployment. Economically, the, the COVID recovery was awesome because the inflation hadn't hit yet, and so we're still living in this fantasy bubble. But he just would not take credit for all the good that he did as president, and he started ranting, and he blew that first debate and lost to Biden. And if he lost again, they wouldn't blame him for a bad campaign which you and I have talked about off air, there's some issues with his campaign. Mm -hmm. The guy got shot. He d literally destroyed his opponent in the debate and had him removed as the candidate. And then he had the best convention ever. 
his talk was the worst part of it. The first 20 minutes were great, but then he just started rambling and it was like, can't you just be like a victim and be nice and talk for 30 minutes and say America's greatest days are ahead of us and wave and walk off? Like this is just yours to lose. So if he, if he runs a bad campaign and he loses, they, the, the Republicans do not have the humility to say, Trump's run three times and won once. Remember in 2022, a year in which the Republicans took control of the House from the Democrats, they still blamed pro-lifers. For, even in a winning year, they blamed pro-lifers that they didn't win by more. Why do you think that is? Because uh, I think the Republicans and pro-lifers have always been sort of a tenuous fit. You've got kind of the conservatives, like the Mike Pence Republicans, but then you've got the Mitt Romney Republicans too. And Mitt Romney said he was pro-life because he needed to, but I don't think any, just as you don't believe Trump when he says he's moderating his pro-life stance, I don't think anybody believed Romney when he said he was pro-life. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll be the crazy pro-life activist. All right. It's because they're not really pro-life. Yeah. And ironically, I think Trump is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that's yeah. the great irony. Because Trump has done stuff that is not Republican pro-life, that is pro-life right. pro-life. And the fact that he wanted to defund Planned Parenthood his first week in office in January of 2017, and Paul Ryan looked at him like he had three heads, like, we can't do that. You're nuts. And he's like, yeah, but they're terrible. I mean, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. You know, and it was just smart. And it, that's pro-life. That's not Republican pro-life. Mm-hmm. And that's basically what you're saying. The reason they always throw the pro-lifers under the bus is because... There's I'll no- give you an example. <laughs> the liberals will love this. This, I spoke to a large group of Republicans at this event. I'll just say it like that. And one of the head guys, like I was invited by like the super awesome pro-life Republican lady, right? And one of the other people who ran this event was an old white guy. Okay, so it's like this young pro-life woman who's like, we gotta have shots, blah, blah, blah. And then the old fart. Crusty. Crusty. He was crusty. He was definitely crusty (laughs) and cringy. He came up, and it was just like Cree. It was definitely right out of a Walker Piercy novel, and he's like, I don't know why you say all that. These kids are just going to do what they do in the back of the car on a Friday night anyways. And I was like, <laughs> um, I'm pro-life. <laughs> like, I didn't know what to say. And the way he, like, whispered it in my ear, and I was oh like, God. I was like, that's the Republican Party? Like, are you kidding? You know, so uh, here we are. We beat up on the Democrats a lot. They deserve it. But, yeah. Uh, that's that's my fear. This is K- uh, Kaylee's fault. Uh, that's the worst scenario. They lose. They won't blame Trump or themselves or the fact that they ran Dr. Oz in 2022 like a bunch of dingbats. And then they blame the pro-lifers. Their only winning issue in the culture war, by the way. And uh, they get it off the platform. And then it, we look a whole lot like Canada, right? They've got totally. Some, they've got a conservative party. Totally. Or Robert talks about in the UK. Yeah. They've got the the Tories and mm-hmm. and the Canadians tell us, and it's good good for me to hear every now and then. Y'all are idiots. For any, they're like any pro lifer complaining about Republicans is so stupid. Y'all are idiots. You have a whole party. Half your country has a platform that is pro life, and y'all complain about it. And of course, my response is, we complain about it, therefore it remains on the platform. Exactly. You got to like hold the feet to the fire. But there is a good point by the Canadians of like, hey, y'all, y'all need to, you know, I guess count your blessings. But um, I don't have high expectations for Republicans and their pro life convictions. But I, I don't care about those. I care about their vote. And that's what matters. And I think most of them now would actually vote to defund Planned Parenthood. It's sort of like the civil rights movement. LBJ was not eager to go push. He wasn't the leader of getting the Voting Rights Act passed. He did so because he was dragged kicking and screaming across the finish line by his own constituents. And we need to be the constituents that drag the party or the candidate or whoever it is kicking and screaming across the finish line to do what's right on abortion. So I know I was beaten up and I'm like, they're not even really that pro-life when it boils down to it. And, and I believe that, but I do think they would defund Planned Parenthood because it's too feel good. You take the, 
seven hundred million dollars, and you give it to either government medical clinics or pregnancy resource centers, or we're actually going to give this to the women that are in need. And that is just too hard for Democrats to go against. They won't do it because they have to, but some of them will. Like a Democrat in Tennessee will. He doesn't have any Planned Parenthood. What does he care? Doesn't he want to fund his local pregnancy center? That's the beautiful thing about Dobbs is that it allows, it, 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 it loosens the belt on Democrats having to say they support all abortions because of Roe v. Wade. That's now gone. So if you're a moderate Democrat from a red state and you got to go home, you'll defund Planned Parenthood. You're getting more money for your— There's so few of those left, though. I know, but it only takes a few to, to swing a vote in Congress now. That's my point. What I'm saying is I don't think you're going to have a lot of Republicans vote to fund Planned right, Parenthood. I, right. I think well, that ship is sailed. In the Senate, you've got two. You've got Murkowski from Alaska, and you've got Collins from Maine. And so that means you need at least 52, Like assuming it otherwise goes party line, you need 52 Republican senators. I think they're at 48 right now. Do you see what I'm saying? You would be denying tax funding for your local clinics because mm-hmm. they're just taking the Planned Parenthood money and giving it to local yeah. medical facilities. For life and... You could be all. It could be the all federally them. qualified the community, community health, centers. health centers. Yeah. Okay. That's where you get the lie to be. That is yeah. a feel good thing. And I think they would get some Democrats to go for it. But there's a red wave and they do that and they defund Planned Parenthood. You want to talk about politics actually impacting your local abortion situation because you're going to you just see Planned Parenthood unload real estate and just close like crazy. So great question. We've got a lot of them on this one. A lot of good yeah. questions. Okay, here's the next one. Explain in simple terms. I think that was directed at Steve. Explain in simple terms what goes on at human clinics. I don't know what I that is. I think they mean fertility. Okay. What goes on at fertility clinics in order to get a human being pregnant? And what is against Catholic teaching and why? I read that human eggs were frozen over 30 years and now is a healthy human baby. Was that only an egg, or was that both an egg that joined with the sperm that was frozen for such a long time? So yeah, th- those are embryos. So it's a it's sperm and egg. A human embryo. Human yeah. embryo it can frozen for a while though too. It could be either. It could be either one. I don't. Yeah, know you can freeze the egg. About. Yeah, but what what we're referencing, I think, the controversial part is the frozen embryos that are there for like thirty years, and then they can fall those people out and i've met a few of those kids they're called snowflake babies not the snowflake like you're a wuss the (laughs) snowflake like like one in a million Mm -hmm. you know kind of deal um it sounds like this person is not catholic but they're against in vitro and they want some clarification or could be catholic but doesn't know how to articulate the message but it's interesting so um what is catholic teaching and why so uh, the the catholic church's teaching is that um, you can't create children outside of the marital act. Right. That children are the fruit of marriage, which is a sacrament between a man and a woman, obviously. And so the fruit of marriage is children, and we can't create children outside of marriage. We, we can through sin, through uh, extramarital sex, um, promiscuity, all of that. Uh, that doesn't mean that the baby is evil. It means that Nature took its course. Sex is reserved for marriage. If you have it outside of marriage, it's still going to work its natural end, which is a, is a baby. Um, in vitro is the artificial creation outside of the sexual act to create a human being. And it feeds into the false notion that we have a right to children. Correct. Which is not true. We have a right to... Seek marriage or seek right. vocation and religious life, and then be open. Obviously, we're called to be open to children um, in that marriage, but we don't have a right to have children no matter what. And that's what in vitro fertilization basically is. As hard, and that's I, I'm sure we're going to get some hate for that because that's not a message that people like. There are it's so not. many people that have children only because of in vitro fertilization. And again, it can't be overstated. Those children are a blessing. Mm-hmm. Those children are have dignity, just like the rest of us. It doesn't matter. Um, it, it's not det- their dignity is not determined on how they got here. It doesn't make the act of in vitro fertilization morally sound. Correct. 
I think that answers that. There we go. Good, good question. Okay, we have time for one more. Uh, okay, yeah, we got to get to this. This is, this is. Okay, here we go. Grace, what a great name. You knew this was coming. How do I reconcile the fact that many Christian, church-going neighbors, friends, and relatives, parentheses, that I have to interact with on a regular basis, say that they believe in God, yet also publicly support abortion and candidates that support abortion? This is just a classic. It's like if you had a president, and he was Catholic, but he was publicly for abortion. Hmm. Well, never mind. No. That's never going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is, um, I guess, the nature of scandal and sin, and we can't, people just want to do what they're, I do think that this is the bad, this is so American in a negative sense of the word, in that we literally hang our faith on the door, and politics is our ultimate God in this country, you know? Yes. I mean, you, let's just take both candidates. Let, let's take this election. If the hardcore Trumpers spent more time in prayer or evangelizing our world towards the gospel with the same enthusiasm they have for Trump, it'd be a better place. If those who spend their life hating Donald Trump and doing anything possible to prevent him from getting office would actually spend more time in prayer and evangelization, the world would be a better place. So politics is, is our religion. Does this mean, Sean, should I take it to mean that you don't have the... the the painting in your office where Trump is at, his, at the Oval Office signing the bill and Jesus is guiding the pen? <laughs> and the, 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 this, is, this is the problem. And Trump is just, I love the guy, right? But like, the, the assassination attempt did not help with this, right? Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's two sides of it. We were just talking about this. First off, you've got like the Jesus holding him in his arm, and just first off, artistically, some of this stuff is so cheesy, but just mm -hmm. Trump and Jesus, and you can never tell which one, who's blessing who, but um, these, some of these images. But then you have what, what we know, which is, that's a miracle, he's alive. And when somebody says, or Trump himself says, I shouldn't be here, God saved my life, they criticize him for that. Like, he can't even authentically thank God publicly. Like, that's how nuts we've gotten in our country. And I, I just, I have a real problem with that, and then I have a problem with the other end, which is, um, you know, now he's Moses, and he's going to lead us to the promised land, and, and he could lose. He is very beatable in November. He could have, God could have saved his life, and he still may lose the election. So people are like, God saved his life because he's going to lead America to the promised land. land. Sure, yeah. And only God can lead America to the promised land. I guess they're saying he'll use Trump. I hope he uses somebody, but I'll quit talking. I gave a talk in a small, wonderful pro-life town last year. Uh, blue state, but small conservative town within that blue state. And there were yard signs all over the town that said, Jesus and Trump saving our children. <laughs> <laughs> That's a local yeah, it's probably like you drove wow. by my mom's house. <laughs> um, a small anonymous town. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. I think my mom may have the like the Jesus trial. I think I've okay. seen that at her out. Yeah. So so and she listens to the podcast. So I love you, mom, and I love. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, some of this is out of control. Where you know, there's the demagogue thing. It th this isn't Trump's fault, by the way. People get mad when I say that, but it's not his fault. He has kind of a cult following, but that's just his personality. People like that draw like a cult following, right? Um, Obama had it. I mean, Obama could do no wrong. Remember the lady saying, "I don't have to have a more. I don't have to pay my mortgage anymore." You know, I mean, it's yeah. just like Jesus was just elected. The campaign artwork looked like Christian iconography. Yeah, it was a little like this with George W. in two thousand. And I'll, I'll throw our evangelical brothers and sisters under the bus because I think there was like this Reagan leftover thing and then Clinton was such a playboy, which is funny to think about now. Um, mm. 
Mm. Clinton had like a normal, calm presidency. And it's like, he cheated on his wife in the Oval Office. It's like, yeah, like that was it. That's quaint. <laughs> yeah, that was, they like, look at it now. <laughs> now, it's, it's, it's like 20 stories bigger than that per week. Lord help us. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like the, Iran wanted to kill Trump. Ah, that's old news. That's was ten, the, the that's biggest assassination attempt that, that week. That, yeah, oh. Seriously. So, I think that Clinton was just like, he's immoral and he's horrible. And so George W. came and he used to drink and he doesn't. And he's a good Baptist or whatever, Methodist. And he's one of us and he's got an accent. And he wears a cowboy hat. And he had a little bit of Messiah going on. Um, and he was extremely likable. I still like George W. Bush. Um, but they, they had a little of that going on. It was a little God versus the pagans. Yeah. Um, Anyways, the, the the irony is that uh, you know that can that can kind of get you in trouble. So, but especially when, with these personal relationships that that Grace is talking about, like I I get it. I live in a far left community, and six months before every election, I just find myself agitated with my neighbors and their stupid signs and their stupid obsession with politics and things like that. And I've got I got close family members who are like activists for for pro abortion candidates. And it's very frustrating. And, and I that's think, tough. Yeah, it's very tough. And at the same time, the only way I think we can deal with it, if they're open to dialogue, then be open to dialogue. But most people aren't. So instead, like, I've, I'm not going to go bring it up at Thanksgiving. We talk about what to say when it helps you at Thanksgiving. You've got to kind of know your audience, right? right? And if this is just going to turn Thanksgiving into somebody just threw the mashed potatoes at your head, it's not the right time or place to do it. And that's why I don't make politics my primary means of evangelization to others instead if i'm not going to get anywhere on, on talking about abortion i'm going to pray for them i'm going to try to witness to them i'm going to try to set a good example i'm going to try to raise healthy children all of those sorts of things perhaps that sounds like a cop-out but i just don't think that um <laughs> we're, we're going to get anywhere with people who aren't interested in listening because they have made politics their god do you know what i'm i guess proud of as a as a father that you know you kind of worry about with young people, with with my teenagers, they get the Trump thing. Like, they get that you're not really supposed to take him seriously. Like, they don't get offended by him. They like him. But it's it's like, they're not going to worship him. And they also know, like, it's it's with a grain of salt, right? Yes. And I think you have to have that because a lot of these generations of years are like, he's going to lock us up. He's a horrible person. Like, like, well, like the nut that shot him, you know. But climate change will kill us all. Climate in three change years. will kill us all, you know. And then uh, he, he said yesterday when he was asked, "What are the first two things you're gonna do?" Um, and he said, "Close the border and drill, baby, drill." <laughs> Just like the environmentalists, is like they're gonna try to kill you again. Oh. Um, but. I think that's encouraging. I think a lot of like young people in like 2016 were like, and 2020 with COVID. But this go around, I just noticed Generation Z has learned to kind of speak Trump. We're like, he's not a dictator. He's a showboat. There's a total difference, you know. What the new kind of shift that I think we're going to see that we're going to have to deal with amongst our friends and family isn't so much age or gen z or whatever it's it's the male female gap which has gotten out of control because i think men of all ages and races are trending more conservative yeah. and women of all ages and races are trending uh liberal and it's really hard to have a functioning society when men and women cannot get along well b uh the black male vote for biden was better like the trending the polling it, was, it pulled better under Biden than Kamala. Better for for Biden. She lost five percent. Okay. Of black males. Okay. And that was my question. I think to you is it is all of these. It's like the the Hillary thing. Like, were white men going to vote for a white lady, and are black males going to vote for a black woman? You know, we don't know. We've never had the scenario. But that polling, that was – she was gaining every other area. She's better than Biden except with black males. I thought that was interesting. Somebody just sent me that poll. Um, everything else, she's she's clearly way better than Biden because Biden was just kind of out of his mind, obviously. But not with black men. Hmm. And so that just speaks to the gender gap that you're, that you're referencing. 
It's really kind of wild to see because we have taken everything to the extreme in identity politics. And so there's this assumption that people are voting on race. And I think that white liberals care about having minority candidates a lot more than minorities themselves do. Like the polls all kind of bear that yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. They're, they're the over. last, like yeah. the African-American electorate was, as you said, it's sort of a different angle on what you said. but. Yeah. When you're looking at who th- who wanted Biden to drop out and who didn't, African Americans wanted Biden to stay in the race by and large. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was interesting. It was very interesting. Okay. Do we? Do you think and, we answered Grace's question? It's hard. I, I don't know that we have, have a magic bullet for uh, for convincing no, Christians. No, no, I think it's a I think it's no. a what to say when yeah. answer. I mean, I think you have to ask questions. Yeah. And and even like Heather out at out at the facilities, you know, saying, "What do you think God thinks of this?" And and I, I like things like, you know, can you, what role, if any, does your Christian faith play in voting? Because some people will say none. This is like the economy. It's immigration. It's secular. It's not. You know, this isn't like. Do I love my kids? Am I going to divorce my wife? So some people are just like. And that's a very compartmentalized, individualistic relationship with Jesus where it's just me and him and whatever else I do in the world doesn't matter. It's horrible. It's not true. But, you know, our relationship with community can't mean that we just hang our faith on the door. Um, And this is where people say it's too rigid, but of course we like it because we're Catholic. But the Catholic Church is teaching your vote can be a mortal sin. Mm-hmm. If it's intended for something, I mean, voting is a just like a budget is a moral document. A vote is a moral act. You know, it's not just flippant. Um, and if it is flippant, that's a sin. This is C.S. Lewis's screw tape, though, because you kind of talk about people making politics their god on either side. And I don't want to make this about Trump. I think it goes far beyond Trump. But you've got screw tape in the screw tape letters saying you've you've got to get the they call the the guy who's sold there trying to steal the patient. You've got to get the patient to identify his faith with his cause. And once you do that, the cause becomes everything and the faith becomes sort of a the pretext for it. I think there's a lot of people who do that. You could ask him in a political sense, what does God think about abortion? Well, I'll tell you what God thinks about the climate. Yes. Yes. Like, whatever it is you care about is suddenly God's priority too, right? Yeah, I think they'd probably accuse us of doing that. Yes, of course. Yeah, God, God is on my side, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you all about it right now. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that, yeah, it, it <laughs> yeah, you keep saying I'm not gonna make it about Trump, but I can't help myself. But this is also the God wants Trump to be president. Mm-hmm. But but then we're applying that to him. Did he want Obama to be president, who right. who was the most pro-abortion candidate ever? Um, did he want Clinton to be president? Did he like what? At what point? Like, well, God, yeah. you know, we do have free will. We do vote. We do campaign. We do message. We got to work, you know. And I think God can bless our work, but that doesn't mean making it successful. We had somebody, we can cut this out if we need to, but... <laughs> Yo, now I really can't wait to hear what you're going to say. <laughs> we took some really sharp criticism from a 40 Days for Life supporter one time who was mad that we were accepting donations on PayPal because, like, the PayPal guy was pro... Yes. Something like that, like, just really hammered us. And then the PayPal guy came out and endorsed Trump, and she's like, never mind, never mind, it's cool. You guys can keep using PayPal. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, so that's the, I haven't, that's, that's the point we're saying. Mm-hmm. So it's either oak, it's either morally wrong to use PayPal, or it's morally fine to use PayPal. Trump can't be the answer to that. Yes, <laughs> that's hilarious. You didn't tell me that. We're not cutting that out. <laughs> and 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, it's crazy. Okay, anything else to add to this? I think we've covered literally everything. We can go back to Tech Mobile if we got some extra time. <laughs> um. So you're, if we secede, you're in. You're moving oh, down for here. Sure. Okay. For sure. Yeah. Think Yeehaw. about that though. You would really do it. I am a diehard, dedicated. I will not leave Wisconsin. It's God's country. But if I were faced with a perpetuity of progressive abortion, LGBT, I would absolutely come to Texas. So in Texas, we have the signs and their their bumper stickers, and it has a Texas flag, and it just says secede, and with an exclamation point. I don't have one. I love America. All that. 
I'm not a Texas can secede guy. They can't. There's, I don't want to get into the legal part of it, but I had to study this and write a paper on it in college. I'm against Texas seceding. And then 2020 came. And no, Emergency but, use only. Yeah, emergency use only. And also when I thought it's always been like there would be a war and all the loons come out. Mm -hmm. And it's actually not that. When I thought about it and I was like, we would give them power because we take our electoral votes. The Democrats would sign on the dotted line. They'd also uh, can use us for our oil. And they get rid of like half the border with Mexico. I mean, it's, it's, there's just more incentive for the United States, if you're a liberal, to get rid of Texas. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem would be like Oklahoma would say, we're going with you. And then uh, Louisiana... And then that, that's where you're like, hey, 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 this kind of feels like 1860. <laughs> right. So we can't, hey, we can't do that. But there can't be a civil war. We like the shape of Texas now. We don't want to change that. And I'm not, shape, I'm yeah. not a civil war. There's never going to be a civil war. It, it can't happen. Lord, please. But it, it's not logistically it can't happen. Number one. This is where we throw in the little disclaimer. As we, of the recording of this as podcast, of the recording of this we podcast, have a civil war breakout. Civil, but there, there, it can never happen. OK, because there is not a more powerful force in the history of the world than the United States military. OK, this isn't where we go get our good old boys out and then we, we get a couple of generals to defect. And all of a sudden we have an army because we have guns and cannons. It's not like that. OK, America has nukes. That's the end of the conversation. There's no secession. So there's just one of those like it's never going to happen. What does that even look like? Like it's not going to happen. I do think peaceful, I'm telling you, I didn't go, I had never traveled internationally until whatever, I was like 28 years old. And of course now we do it all the time. And you just bop around Europe and all these countries used to be part of one another. And you know, you go to Czechoslovakia or whatever. And you're just like, it's, 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 it's not, every time I'm in London, that was so genius of them to keep their currency and to not join the EU. Like it's, it's like, the Brits are still the Brits. It's like they do one thing every 10 years, like Brexit. It's like, oh, yeah, maybe y'all actually do care about democracy. I need to know before I have to make this decision. <laughs> native, native Texans. I want to see you walk in to your house after this trip. <laughs> and you're like, honey, clean the house. <laughs> We're going to do an open house this weekend. As a Wisconsinite who would be a Wisconsinite in exile, I would continue to root for the Green Bay Packers. How would the native Texans, who are a very proud people, feel about me other than the Cowboys? I could come and I could s swear an oath on Davy Crockett's autobiography that I affirm Texas, the great state of Texas, and all its values and all that it holds. This is true. part of your citizenship training. Yes. Yes. Like, what degree of welcomeness would I have? Would I be like... Are you reading for the Astros? No, no, no. 100%. 100% welcome. <laughs> okay. Because Texas is the friendliest state. It's our motto. And we are friendly with Californians yeah. who move here with that okay. share our values. Yeah, and, so. we, and we Texas is the most diverse state in the union. Ah. It's the most diverse state, okay, of all nationalities, culture, e beliefs. Yeah. So we beat California, okay? So d th we like different people as long as you fall in line. But, like, it's <laughs> – it, you would the, you'd be you'd okay. be loved. You got well, your Packer like flag out. I like barbecue. I like every. It's just like the, the sports allegiances would remain, and I would still have an affection for the home country. I didn't mean country. we're gonna have like Jim Ball and people like I'm coming down. You know, like <laughs> people. I feel like I said. I feel like I told the kids. I didn't mean for the secession thing to happen, but I feel like I told the kids it may snow on Christmas. And now they're just like, the excitement, and it's like not going to happen. There's no chance of snow. <laughs> There's no chance of secession. But now everybody's like, you're, you're, planning, you're planning to sell your house. And you're like, Steve, this probably isn't going to happen. Not that big of a leap. But your if, colors are red, white, and blue, too. If, if America just totally goes down, I mean, I mean, and look at the attraction, the people that it would, that it would bring. Elon, you know, is already here. It's just, it's... Uh, Elon and Steve Carlin. Yeah. We got Greg Abbott. You know, I'm telling you, it's, it's got a lot of potential. We're going to get some emails on this one. So we Did the banter on the end of this one. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. Well, it, it, it's, it's food for thought. <laughs> I want people to email me and tell me if I'm wrong. 
about the electoral thing being incentive. As you said, they would never lose another election. The problem is Texas would be shameful to be throwing America under the bus because we'd basically be saying it would be a very selfish move. But um, hey, you didn't ask for a bunch of commies to take over the country. I, exactly, and I we, and then we we have an abortion. We're abortion free, and you know you just kind of like we're not doing the transgender stuff. We don't have that in Texas. I don't know. I think the New Yorkers would be like, get out of here. So. All right. With that, please email us whatever you want on any of these topics at podcast at 40daysforlife.com, podcast at 40daysforlife.com. Be sure to pick up your uh, copy of What to Say When 2. It's going to be out in a couple of weeks on September the 10th, so you can pre-order that and get free shipping and support our mission uh, at our store, 40daysforlife.com. Just click on the store and be sure to order that. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, Heather. Be sure to rate, review, and share this podcast, and we will see you next time. God bless you.